And today we're going to be continuing our sermon series in James. I'm really excited about this. I'm, uh, last week, Joby started and kicked off the series uh, very strongly and uh, asked some great questions about what we do when trials arise. What do we do when trials arise? Do we typically run away or do we uh, face them head on? Do we do what we're supposed to do? He gave us some great counsel on how we should react during a trial versus being kind of a one foot in, one foot out type person, double-minded person, we are to pray and we are to ask God for wisdom. And so today we'll be continuing those thoughts and those ideas in James, continuing on talking about such fun stuff. I know you guys love to talk about sin and temptation. Yippee! But we're here to talk about sin and temptation, not to fill you with guilt and condemnation, but so that we can see it, so that we can notice it, so that it doesn't lead to death in our lives. So let's go ahead and open up your Bibles to James uh, chapter 1, verse 13. Verse 13, it says, Let no one say when he is tempted that I am being tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted with evil. And he himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted when lured, when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. And then desire, when it is conceived, gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. So do not be deceived, my beloved brothers. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. Of his own will, of his own will, of his own plan, brought us forth by the word of truth that we should be a kind of first fruits of his, crea- of his creatures. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the honesty and the truth of your word. Sometimes it's not easy to hear the hard things that are in the word. But one thing, God, I pray that we be very, very thankful for is the honesty of the word. We thank you for the honesty of James and his instruction to us this morning. I pray, Lord God, that you would just take any thoughts that I have, any selfish motives that I have, and you would change my just even selfish and evil desires that I so often have, and you would mold them to be more like you this morning. So that, Lord God, I would preach a message that would be helpful to my friends here this morning that we would all learn something, we would all grow, and we would all, hopefully by your grace, just walk away feeling the freedom we have in you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So verse 13. Look at verse 13 first. It says, Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. I'm going to say something that's obvious to most of us, because it's in the Word and in my text today. God doesn't tempt anyone. You might actually agree with that, theologically. You might say, yeah, I get it. God would obviously never do that, right? Right? That would be against his character. That would be a violation of who he is for him to tempt us. The Bible says that he is good. The Bible says that he is loving. So maybe if you're a Christian and you're here, you've never actually said or believe that God is tempting you. Maybe you've never directly said that. But maybe you've said things after something bad happens in your life. You just go, really? I mean, 
seriously, Lord? Like, why did my car break down this week? I mean, last week I had money, and it break, broke down this week. There's many things that we can say that don't exactly blame God for tempting us, but we act like these things that happen in life are his fault. We give him the credit for the bad. If this life wasn't so hard, then maybe I'd actually be the disciple and the Christian that you've called me to be. How about this one? If I had better, I mean, fill in the blank. If God, you would just give me, then I would be this way. What is it for you? What's that thing that you feel like God is holding back on you and not giving you? That if you felt like you had, you would be something different. If you're a kid, you're here. We have the junior hires in here today and some high schoolers. If my parents weren't so strict, then maybe I would have listened. I would have been obedient. If my boss would just give me a raise. Lord, you're in control. You're sovereign. Would you just convince my boss? Just show him what I'm doing here. I'm working hard. Just a little bit more. I just need a little bit more. So we're not actually saying that we believe that God would ever tempt us. But we do by the way we act, don't we? Through my complaining, I blame God for my sin. I'm saying, God, you corner me into sin because of the life you've given me. That's how I'm acting. But my friends, God doesn't toy with us. He's not an ant bully with a magnifying glass on us, enjoying to watch us suffer through life. He's not messing with you. He's in control of this world. He's in control of everything, even our Mondays. He's in control of your spouse. You're not. He's in control of your kids. He's in control of your worst enemy. Your worst enemy. Do you know who your worst enemy is? Let's go to verse 14. And here's James. I love James. I love the word of God and its honesty. Here's James, verse 14. But each of you is tempted when he is lured and when he is enticed. By who? By who? By his desire. We are lured. We are enticed. We are tempted by our own desires. So who do you think your worst enemy is? The bad news first, this morning, I'll say it as lovingly as I can. I hate to say it, but you are. I'm my own worst enemy. If you're a mom, I mean, little Johnny didn't make you get upset. Your own selfish desires caused you to do that. We are tempted and we are enticed by our own desires. This is bad news for us. But just the same, I hope you can receive that this morning. Paul Tripp says it like this. This is in your notes. It's only ever the evil inside of you that hooks you to the evil that's outside of you. I'll read that again. It's only ever the evil inside of you. What is going on inside of your heart, your desire to have it things your way. Whatever that be, your desire for comfort above all things. Your desire for control above all things. That desire, it's only ever the evil inside of you that hooks you to the evil that is outside of you. So when Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, it wasn't the apple's fault. It wasn't the enemy's fault. It was their fault. It was their hearts 
that lured and enticed them to bite the forbidden fruit. The heart is the engine that runs our bodies. It controls our minds and it controls our desires. In the Word of God, there are over 900 verses on the heart. Jeremiah 17.9 says, The heart is deceitful above all things. It is desperately sick. Who can understand it? And the Word says, For out of the heart, evil thoughts, murder, adultery, that's where all of these things start starts from our hearts. So sin is not first a behavioral problem. Sin is first a heart problem. Sin is first not a behavioral problem, the things we do. Sin is first starting, the root of sin starts at the heart. Eric's dark heart Eric's dark heart is the reason Eric sins. Eric is lured and tempted by Eric's own selfish and evil desires. The enemy gets way too much credit for sin. Way too much credit. The devil didn't make me do it. Did not make me do it. It's definitely true. It's definitely true that we wrestle with evil forces. We wrestle and we get tempted by the enemy. That is definitely true. I am not going to ignore that verse. But we give it way too much credit. My biggest enemy is not Satan. My biggest enemy is me. It's funny, when I was studying, I call this funny, it's not really funny, but it's kind of funny. I'm studying on temptation. And you'd think that I wouldn't be tempted when I'm studying on temptation, right? And I was lured myself. It was 9.30. It was on Monday night. And like I explained to you guys earlier, I had lost eight hours of sermon notes. And it's 9.30. I had worked all day. So I came home. I had dinner with my family, and I was working on the sermon. And it's, it's 9.30, and I was, fr- I was frustrated. I wasn't excited yet about what I was doing because I hadn't gotten knee-deep into the sermon. I hadn't gotten knee-deep into the verses. At some point, these verses start to really preach to my heart, but I wasn't there yet. I was frustrated that it wasn't going well. In that moment, my wife comes up and asks me, can you take out the dog to go pee? Simple question, right? She said, well, just so you guys know, I'm the best at getting our dog to go pee. I take him out, and in two seconds, he goes pee for me and comes right back out. He won't do that for my wife and my kids. And so they had tried. They had already tried. But in this moment, I'm thinking to myself, really? Somebody else couldn't do this. I'm a little busy here with the Word of God. And I'm tired. So in this moment, what's happening? The hook's there. The bait's there. What is it? I want the comfort. I want control. I want to be in charge of what I'm doing. So what do I do? So this is the moment, men, where we, we pray for these moments. It sounds weird, but we pray for these moments to show our wives how much we love and care and want to serve and be that servant leader. Will you take out the dog? Easy one. Yes, dear. Go do it. I grabbed the leash, frustrated, and stormed off. I did it, but did it complaining. I did it with a bad heart. I did it with a bad motive. I did it in anger. And so... Let, let us go to verse 15 and 16, and we're going to see how this lure, this idea of the lure, where it starts to create more when we fall into it, and we start to bite that bait. So as verse 15 says, and 16 say, so then desire, when it, it, is, when it, it has conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. Do not be deceived, my brothers. The desire of wanting rest 
in this moment, right? That was it for me. My moment of wanting what I wanted, my comfort. I wanted my control. That completely took over to me. And like I said, these are the moments that we have. These are the moments. And I missed it. Proverbs 14, 12 says, There's a way that seems right to a man, but in the end leads to destruction. My way seemed right in that moment. I need to just stay here focused on this sermon for the next five hours. And you interrupted me. How dare you make me serve? How, how dare you make, make me actually obey the things I'm teaching? So I have to remind myself, church. I have to remind myself that my ways and my thinking are so often off. They're so often wrong. The bait in this moment was that comfort for me, wasn't it? I was like a dumb fish. I grabbed that leash and I stomped off. So sometimes I wonder, I wonder this, God, why have you saved me? Why have you redeemed me? Why have you done this? And I'm still sinning. I'm still messing up. This is a small example, I know. It's a, it's a little bit silly. But the bigger ones, too. Why am I still sinning? This is when I have to remind myself that I haven't arrived yet. As Paul says in Romans 7.15, he says, For I do not understand my own actions, and I do not do what I want. He says, But I do the very thing that I hate. What lures you? Right now, you might be staring at a hook with bait on it. What is it that is luring you? And you may be blaming somebody else for it. As in that moment, I'm blaming my dog. How dare you have to go pee? My wife, why couldn't you just figure this out? My kids, why couldn't you guys just do this? Every, it was everybody else's fault but my own fault. This is where I have to remind myself that I haven't arrived yet. There's something still deeply off with me, right? We aren't there. That I crave what I shouldn't crave and I don't do what I should do. I don't serve my wife so often, but instead I'm on my phone. Why do we do this stuff? Church, the bad news is, is that we can be a, a big mess. We can be a big mess. And that more bad news is we can be our own worst enemy. The best thing, though, that can happen to me, and why that's good news within bad news, is figuring out that you're the problem, you figured out a problem. You figured out that it's you. It's not everybody else. You need to work on you. The best thing that could happen to yourself is you get to the end of yourself, like the prodigal son did. And what this does is it typically points me as I see that I am incapable of of fixing myself by myself, that I am the darkness and I need the light. That's good news. That is a good, great realization to see that you are in darkness and you need the light. There are a lot of people walking around in this planet right now with a big hook in their mouth. And they don't know it. There's a huge blessing to know where you are at and where you need to go. So I want you to be encouraged at least with that part. And so James is this tough and tender sort of pastor you can hear in his words here and just gives us a hard word about how it's your fault. You're the enemy. You're the bad guy here. The reason you're sinning is you're 
evil heart. That's bad news. And that is not easy to hear, especially on what, for most people, is a four-day weekend. We're partying all weekend. We're having fun. And to hear a sermon like this about how I'm the problem, at, at, at first glance, it's not very encouraging. So James reminds us. James adds something to this. Check out verses 17 and 18. He says, Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, from whom there is no variation. Our God does not change. Our God does not fall into temptation. And it says, or shadow due to change. Meaning he doesn't, he's not going to waver. He's not going to bite the bait that we will bite. Verse 18 says, of his own will, this is by his great gospel plan, he brought us forth by the word of truth. He brought the gospel to us that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. So although James gave us bad news in verses 13 for 16, that the dark starts in our hearts, here he brings some better news, some good news for us, that the light has come, the light radiates that the Father of light delivers to us the word of truth. The good news is the perfect gift has come down from above, came down from above, and not to condemn us, but to free us. For God so loved sinners like me that he gave us, he gave me that light so that I could have eternal life so that I could be forgiven. And when he showed up, he didn't come to fill me with guilt and shame. And we don't bring this up this morning to fill you with guilt and shame, but to free you so that you could see what lures you, so you could see what tempts you, so you could see that there is a nice, shiny, disgusting, evil hook in back of that bait that looks so good to you right now. There's a perfect gift, as James says here. Our God is the giver of perfect gifts. And one of the best gifts he gave us was a spotless lamb. The spotless lamb, as he experienced temptation, Jesus experienced temptation when he came down. He came, in a sense, to be tempted, to overcome that temptation, and to live a sinless life. As a child, he was tempted to disobey his parents, but he didn't. As a teenager, he, didn't, he chose obedience, didn't he? Jesus chose obedience as a teenager, and he didn't do what teenagers do, right? And at the desert, while Jesus was fasting for 40 hours in the desert, he was tempted, he was hungry, he was tired, and he didn't fall into that temptation. He was exhausted. Could you imagine that? I can't fast for four days, let alone 40 hours, 40, 40 days. That's insane. And as Hebrews 2, 17 through 18 says, it says this, Therefore he, Jesus, had to be made like his brothers in every respect. This is God himself became to, came down to be a man. And because he himself suffered when he was tempted... He was able, and he is able today. He was able then, he's able now, and he'll be able in the future to help you because he's experienced that temptation. Jesus was made human. He was tempted. And the good news, church, he's able to relate. Our God has lived this life. Our God has been through trials. Remember, that the night before the cross, that the humanity of Jesus is shown as he's struggling to answer the call to die on the cross. And he says, as he falls on his face, my father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. In this moment, the enemy was luring him 
offering him a baited hook, offering him, is there a different way for humanity to be redeemed? But unlike us, he never gave in. He never sinned. He lived that life. And Jesus was made human. He suffered. And he's able to relate. So in your moments of pain, in your moments of struggle, in your moments of doubt, you're able to run to him. You're able to confidently approach the throne. Hebrews 4, verse 14 through 16 says this, We do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect was tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive and find grace to help in time of need. We can confidently run to Jesus. We can confidently come to Jesus with our sin. We could confidently come to Jesus, whatever doubts, whatever we're experiencing, whatever temptation we're facing, after we've bitten the hook and the hooks in our mouth, we could confidently come to Jesus. Because I don't know about you guys, but after I bite that bait, I can beat myself up pretty good. And this is where every time Jesus was tempted, he used the word of God against the enemy. Every time he was tempted. We must believe the word of God. Romans 8.1 says that there is no condemnation. Usually we are the ones who put the condemnations on ourselves after we sin. Instead of running to Jesus, getting grace, and believing that he has forgiven our five minute ago sin. We know he forgave our past sin, but he just, did he just forgive that sin I committed a second ago? Yes, he did. Is he going to forgive the next one in five seconds? Yes, he will. Because you have been given the word of truth, church, the perfect gift has been given to you from the Father. 1 Corinthians 5.21 says it like this. For our sake, he, this is God, made him, Jesus, to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we could become the righteousness of God. This is Jesus, the one who knew no sin. He actually lived the perfect life that we could not live. Nails our sin to the cross, and he gives us credit for his perfect life. So yes, Jesus was perfect. God the Father, though, made him to become our sin. That's what it says. For our sake, he made him to be sin, who knew no sin, who lived the perfect life, to be regarded and to be treated as the one who bit the bait. I gave a gift to Jesus. See, the Father gives us good gifts, as we just read. He gives us per the perfect gift and the spotless lamb. But in this great exchange, in this text in 1 Corinthians 5.21, my gift to Jesus is this. All of my past, all of my present, and all of my future sins. Here you go. They're yours. And the spotless lamb goes to the cross, to his slaughter, with my sin on his back. I gave my sin, my evil thoughts, my evil desires, everything, and he nails it to the cross. Church, he's nailed our idol worship, our lust, our greed, our rebellion, our worrying about things that we can't control, our gossiping, our jealousy, our anger, our laziness, and our apathy. This was for our sake that the Father of lights made his Son become our sin and gift to us Jesus' resume. Here you go. You're going to walk in on a job interview and you're going to get Jesus' resume. How would you like that? And your interviewer is God the Father. And he looks at it and you say, wow, you're hired. You're seen perfect in my eyes. 
I don't see any stain. I don't see any blemish. All has been taken care of. By his wounds you are healed, church. By his punishment it has brought us peace. Inside the gift is the perfect life that Jesus lived. It's credited to us. You're given credit for everything he did. I would love to get credit for things like, you know, my, my boss makes a lot of money. I would love to get credit for how much money he makes and then put into my account. That'd be a good deal, just once. But this is better. I know we've heard this before. A lot of us have heard this verse. A lot of us have studied this verse. But it's really easy to get lackadaisical about hearing the gospel. This is good news. Jesus has credited to you his righteousness. Receive that one. Just like you received, and you probably believed that you were the enemy. Yeah, yeah, I can believe that I'm the enemy, but I just don't believe that Jesus would actually forgive me for all the bad things I've ever done. I say I do, but I don't really act like I do. Do you live free? Do you believe that your Savior has traded your sin and given you his perfect and spotless life? Because he has. This is why it's called the good news. That's why there's bad news before the good news, because the good news sounds even better. And he can look at you with new eyes, church, because your sin is completely paid for. He doesn't see what you did five minutes ago. He doesn't see what you're going to do. And he doesn't hold it against you. He's not withholding anything from your life because you bit the bait. This is why we can say, the old has passed away and the new has come. We get credit for his obedience. And God the Father is now pleased. If you are a Christian, if you are in Christ, so not only are you pardoned, you're pardoned by the great judge, but you're also seen perfect in his eyes and you're given a new identity. You're given a completely new identity. This drastically changes us in light of the great exchange. We're brought from darkness into light. And I'm reminded that, as I said earlier, although I'm a mess, although I'm my own worst enemy, that he brought forth the word of truth to me. He revealed that to me. The good news, the gospel, his word reminds me that through and though my desires are so off, so often, that Psalm 37, 4 says it like this, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. So if you're here this morning and your desires are completely off, you're not excited about the things of God, you're not excited to serve the church, you're not excited to come to church, you're not excited about the word of God, you have no motivation to even lift your hands up and sing. Pray this verse, that you would delight yourself in the Lord. Delight yourself in Him who traded all, 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 all of your sin and gave you His perfect life. Someone who would do that for me deserves to be honored in my life. So out of the mess that I make out of my life, Romans 8.28 reminds me, as I'm reminding myself of the word of God, God, all things work together for your good. All things work together for your good. For those who are loved and called according to your purpose. So be encouraged, church. You have been set free from sin and death by the power of the word of God, by the power of the gospel. Galatians 5.1 says it like this, For freedom Christ has set you free. Therefore, stand firm and do not submit yourselves again to the yoke of slavery. Stand firm. Know that you are free. Don't run back to that jail cell that you've been freed from. The keys were thrown. 
You're looking for the keys. You're trying to find the jail cell keys to go back to your jail cell. That's what we do when we sin. We could learn from the Israelites. They were freed. And they complained about their freedom. And they wanted to go back to Egypt where things were easier and more comfortable for them. So they thought, why run back to slavery when you're free? To summarize and close, uh, maybe you're going through a tough season right now. Maybe you're going through a trial. Maybe you're just being tempted left and right, and you're wondering what in the world is going on right now. You're in a trying season. I go back to Joby's word last week. This is where we ask for wisdom. We pray for wisdom. We go back to verse 12 that we studied last week. We have that motivation that we're going to receive that crown of life. That this life isn't it. There's more. This life is quick. But we have eternity because of what the spotless lamb has done for us. We have eternity. I want to challenge you if you're not meeting with someone about what you're seeing about that baited hook that you're looking at, things that you're being tempted in. Find someone. Find a good Christian who you can be accountable with. If you're not in a community group, I ask you to join one where you can get accountability for these things. And we can help one another. And we can all not laugh about our sin, but just not take ourselves so seriously and encourage one another and point each other to the Word of God point each other to truth so we can stand firm so that we could believe and walk in a newness in a free freedom so that we can know that we will fall short we definitely will fall short but the good news is that through Christ we're victorious amen church let's pray So Lord, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you so much for the honesty in your word about how you tell us that God, this, these evil desires where sin starts, the root of sin is in us. We need to desperately seek to kill our sin. We need to do this using, God, your word as Jesus showed us. When he is tempted, God, we need to pray as Jesus did. And Lord God, we need to be around other Christians who help point us to you. Help us to learn how to do this better, Lord. Help us to be honest and bold with one another and where we're at and our sins and our struggles. Uh, I pray that we wouldn't just be a church that would look good and have a good facade, but Lord God would be just real and transparent with where we're at in life. I pray for more of that in our church. And also, Lord God, not just ending with transparency. That is not the goal. The goal, God, as we said earlier, is worship. We want to get to the point where our sin isn't blocking us from seeing you clearly. That we are able to come to the throne confidently. We are able to bow before the Lord, our God, our maker, Lord God. Even though we will mess up, Lord God. That your grace is sufficient. And Lord God, help us to stand firm and to remember that we are free. In your name we pray. Amen.